So hi, Elliot. It's good to see you. And um, it's really been uh, nice for us to be able to connect over the last couple of weeks. And uh, those of you who are watching us you, uh, should know that we are also in touch with other rabbis at similar sized congregations and doing the type of work that Rabbi Cosgrove and I are doing. I'm also happy that we're able to bring our two congregations together. Um, many of you may know that there is significant overlap in membership. Many of our snowbirds come from the Upper East Side and are members of, of Park Avenue. And in addition, we know that uh, many of you who do not come down to Boca, um, as uh, Franz Rosenzweig might have said, you, you haven't come down to Boca yet. And there will always be a place for you at B'nai Torah. We feel that there's a lot of similarities, so you'll always be welcomed here. Um, so in addition to the overlap of congregants, uh, Rabbi Cosgrove and I, although we are, are both ordainees of JTS and from, a, from different decades, there is a lot of overlap between the two of us, both because of our work, because we're both JTS ordainees, we're both connected to the Hartman Institute, both have deep commitments to the Masorti movement. And so it's really a pleasure to enter into this uh, chat. Additionally, I don't know if many of your congregants know it or if my congregants remember, but before you were ordained, you served as a high holiday uh, overflow service uh, rabbi here at B'nai Torah and people, uh, people really appreciated you as uh, everyone who learns from you does. So. This past uh, week, there was a, a, a piece published in the forward that you had written about your experiences as a rabbi now during this uh, very, very difficult and very painful uh, time. And so maybe we can start there, um, uh, Elliot. Will you talk a little bit about that piece or talk a little bit about the experiences that you've had over the last, uh, the last few weeks? Thank you. And, uh, you know, we're friends. So on this call, I'll call you David, but Rabbi Steinhardt, um, thank you so much for making this happen and for the warm invitation and for your friendship through and through. Um, you're right. You you were the guy who gave me a start in the in Pete's ballroom, uh, I think it was called. Um, for a couple of years, I, I flew down to Boca. Um, at the time, I had in-laws who were in, uh, what's it called, Broken Sound? Is that the name of the uh, place? So right. um, yeah. I, it, it was, um, uh, you, you never forget who, who gives you your start. And you went, um, so not to interrupt, it, but then you went from JTS to uh, Anshay Amath in Chicago, where you served with uh, my uh, oldest friend in the rabbinate and Clarissa partner, uh, Michael Siegel. Exactly. So. I do get reports about your work. Well, with, with that spirit, just to add to the warmth, and then we'll actually get to the, the substance at hand, David. Um, you know, no different than I'm sure my old boss, Michael Siegel, um, and you have all sorts of stories pre rabbinate um, Your dear colleague is my dear friend, um, David Englander, Rabbi Englander, um, who not only did we, were we roommates in uh, rabbinical school, um, but also classmates at University of Michigan. Um, and so um, the, it's not just our congregants who overlap, it's not just um, our, our teachers and the institutions that produced us, but it, it's a real friendship um, between B'nai Torah and Park Avenue Synagogue. And I hope that while these circumstances are um, not of anyone's choosing right now, um, I think something like this, a dialogue between our communities, um, rabbis, cantors, and otherwise, may, may we uh, use this as an opportunity to just to increase our bond between our, our, our communities. So uh, thank you for making this happen. Um, I, I, I wrote a piece that was from a drasha I gave this past Shabbos on Achremot Kedoshim, and it, it's, David, the, the honest way to respond, and I want to hear what you're facing uh, in Boca, um, I've never seen anything like it. I actually um, tracked that there's been an exponential growth in um, death and dying uh, in the community as compared to March and April of last year. Uh, and, I mean, I could tell you right now 
that um, I have, um, I was at the cemetery yesterday. I have a Zoom Shiva tonight. Someone else is um, imminently about, I mean, I can go through the sort of life cycle events in my mind right now um, that are taking place. I don't know what the breakdown is um, numerically. I would say, let's just call it 50-50. 50% are um, people who have been afflicted um, with COVID-19. Um, and then I would say 50% are what I call COVID adjacent, um, meaning elderly and infirm uh, members of our community, staff, family, family members of members who, all of whom are under the clergy's pastoral care, who, um, you know, are either because they're not getting chemo, they're not having their physical therapy, um, their checkups, whatever, you know, those actions are that keep us engaged in this world, um, or um, because, and I need to say this very delicately, um, I think the, the um, hospitals and healthcare system are being put in a position in New York City of prioritizing healthcare um, according to an urgency that um, is, um, is, is resulting in, in, um, in, in a terrible decision making that, that's anything but normal. And so um, with that as a backdrop, um, you know, there, there's no public assembly. So, well, actually before that, um, uh, end of life decisions are being made at a distance. There are, you know, I'm saying v Dewey to people over the phone with a healthcare professional holding a phone to someone's ear, the deathbed prayer. Um, family members are having to make end of life decisions at a distance. Um, people are saying goodbye to their loved ones, not knowing that it's the last time that they're going to see that person. People at graveside are just being told you're Tuesday at 11, you're Wednesday at noon. Um, depending, every day it changes depending on the cemetery. I don't know how it works in Boca, but in New York, there are you know, there could be a dozen different cemeteries. Each one plays by their own rules. I don't say that in a critical way. It's just, you don't know until you pull up. Five people maximum, no one's allowed graveside. Just fam, I, I don't know actually from funeral to funeral. And then, um, and then obviously uh, people are showing up with masks on. There's no hugs, there's no handshakes. The prayers are said, you can't pass a shovel one to the other um, because that involves touching the shovel. So people, yesterday at, at Graveside, people took handfuls of earth and placed it um, there um, in, in a person's final resting place. And then the post-shiva, post-burial rituals have all been upended. Um, I think the, uh, you know, I think we're doing the best we can with Zoom shivas. They're actually quite moving, you know, just like you and I can look at each other's face right now. When you're in a, someone's crowded living room, you know, you might catch that person, you might not. But when you're all present, you're actually hearing an individual speak lovingly of their mother or their father or their brother in a way that you don't um, normally. Um, and... Um, and then um, one of the things that weighs heaviest on me right now, and then I'm, I thank you, I'm, I've, I've been going on too long, is um, the follow-up, right? People don't have a minion to go to. We, we have Zoom minions, but um, it's not the same. Not, not to say the prayers, but to be greeted and welcomed by a community. Um, it's a social support system. And so that's very tough. Um, and I think that we are then running off to the next death. And so whatever those normal things that clergy on a good day do to call someone a week later to check in, we're not. Um, and so we're trying to create our Bikur Cholim and other things so maybe lay people can step up 
and make the calls because I'm already three funerals down the line at that moment. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really, it's really un unprecedented here. I don't even have time to think about like the theological issues that are on my mind, right? You know, it, it's just, uh, you're, you're, uh, going one moment to the next. Um, tell me, I'm, I'm curious, um, David, um, a, just because we share so many members are what, what's happening in Florida. Cause I know an equal number of people are listening in from New York to Florida and Florida, New York, and as well as around the country. And, and I'm wondering, have you had any chance to sort of even begin to to make sense of this moment uh, theologically as as a rabbi? Um, sort of a two part question for you. Um, yeah. What are you seeing, and what are you what are you thinking? And I think uh, first of all, I'm sure that I'm seeing uh, uh, many fewer uh, COVID uh, deaths, but am experiencing the. Um, the implications of COVID deaths through family members and some of the stories that come to me and then, you know, some of the, the reality that I'm experiencing are things that, like you said, you know, I never would have believed that I would have seen in my rabbinate or even in my lifetime. Perhaps the most heartbreaking of all was a couple who uh, perhaps they're in their mid to late seventies. They have a 50 year old son who was, in New York and was, uh, had been on respiratory uh, uh, aid for a, uh, a while and was, they were called by the hospital. They could not go visit him and they were, had to make uh, decisions about end of life. And they felt, they wondered how they could do it from here and they called me for some advice and I asked some questions and I told them they need a little bit more information and then the next day they call me and say, they don't have to make any decision that their son passed away. And now they don't know if his body will be released from the hospital, when it will be released from the hospital. Nobody would be at the burial site that they had out in Long Island. And so everybody has this sense of being removed from it. And it's very eerie and it's very, very tragic. And there's people feeling, feeling quite empty. We've had a few COVID cases here in my congregation Thank God there has not been a single COVID death. But for some reason, and I don't know if it's like a post-Pesach phenomenon, but there were more deaths two weeks ago than I've ever experienced in my 38 years in the rabbinate. And so each of them have to be treated differently than we did previously. And I experienced the same thing that you described, and that is this sense of helplessness and um, just not being fully present because I could call people on the phone but I didn't see them. I wasn't at their Shiva minions and I couldn't greet them at the minions at the show while they're saying, and as they say, Kaddish. So they join us on, on Zoom and my heart breaks for, for all of them, for sure. Um, so we've had, I, you know, we have people who have lost family members to COVID. We've had people who have had COVID and have, have survived it. And now we're just, the numbers are down here. I just spoke with an emergency room doc at one of the local hospitals who told me that they just have 20, this is Delray uh, Community Hospital there, there are only about 20 to 25 COVID patients there. So we've been kind of fortunate and I think part, partially it's because the social separation, the physical space is much greater than in a place like the city. Um, and so people have uh, been socially distanced from each other and have taken that part seriously. Obviously the concern right now is how do people return you know, back to their jobs and to, to society as it were. Um, but the other piece of it then, especially having a larger elderly population is just dealing with the aloneness and the loneliness of so many people and the fear that everyone is feeling. And we have to give voice to that because we undoubtedly uh, feel, that our, feel that ourselves. So. I'm grateful, you know, the technology, it sometimes feels exhausting and it's ongoing, it's constant. I don't feel as if I've ever worked as hard as I'm working now. And I would imagine that's your experience too. Um, and yet I'm grateful for the technology. It's, you know, allowed us to create, uh, uh, to stay in contact. I've said to our community a number of times, we may be either isolated or quarantined as individuals, but our community's not. 
quarantine. And so we, you know, worked really hard, very quickly to get everything possible onto uh, different platforms. So we have all of our, we have adult education going in bar mitzvah classes in Hebrew school and minyan, minyanim twice a day and Shabbat services. And so- Are you, are you doing B'nai Mitzvah in your community? Or? Well, a, no, a number of B'nai Mitzvah uh, postponed, but the kids had already learned the Parsha for that particular Shabbat. So we are including them in the service, allowing them to do a little bit of the Kriya, a little d- bit of davening. This past Shabbat, we had a full bar mitzvah. The, the kid led Shachrit together with a cantor and uh, read some of to- the Torah, the Haftorah, and received a bar mitzvah charge. And it was actually quite nice. It, and it worked out nicer than we would have thought. Initially, we were live streaming, by the way. And then we went to Zoom. And we found that Zoom is really a much more effective platform to let people f- see each other and people need to see each other. You know, it's one thing that we can touch each other, but we still have the capacity to see each other. And that's, uh, that's been pretty yeah. important. It also helps you have a great chazan by you. Magda. And you too, you know, we have two of the greatest chaz- chazanim in the country, I think. And so it does make a difference. Magda Fishman is clearly, you know, uh, such a compelling presence in person and even, you know, on the internet. And so, and very sensitive to, to this stuff. So it's been great. Yeah, you are a very, very lucky congregation, almost as lucky as Park Avenue with Ozzy Schwartz, um, right. <laughs> with a gem. So um, I think one of the blessings of both of our rabbinates is that we get to serve our communities with um, these hugely talented and compassionate and sensitive uh, uh, cantors who, who, I, who have a friendship of their own. And I bet yeah. you that if it was Magda and Ozzy on a Zoom call, there'd be a lot more than the couple hundred that we have right now. There'd be, uh, you know, so, because um, well, the only thing better than two rabbi. Maybe that's can't. next. Maybe, maybe we should. <laughs> yeah. So, so let, me ask, you, let yeah. me ask you, and by the way, just uh, so everyone knows, um, if you're listening in and you're participating, there is a Zoom chat bar. I'm not sure, David, if you let people know, but if you have questions for us after uh, we go back and forth, um, please type in your um, questions here. And that's the way uh, both David and I have that in front of us uh, so we can uh, participate, so we can answer your questions. David, I, I don't want to let my my other questions slip. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> You know, seeing as neither of us are, are cantors, uh, but we're rabbis, um, what, what, you know, ha- have you even begun to think theologically of this moment? Is, is there some way that we can make sense of, of this moment as, as, as a rabbi? I think that it, it's, it's really a, a good question. And, and like all the issues that we're surrounded by right now, there's so much that feels unknown, but, um, I'm I'm always thinking theologically, as I'm sure you are, at least when you have like a moment to breathe. And I've been presented with some questions, some questions that feel very, very simple and basic, but obviously they come to they come to people's minds. So I will talk about three different things here. Uh, and one has, you know, one has to do with the whole notion of the, the theodicy question. That is, you know, if God is good, then how does this happen in the world? And so there, you know, the, so part of what I do is I go back to a lecture that David Hartman gave about 12 years ago, where he spent a lot of time talking about this whole concept of Olam Kimin Hago No Hag. You know, the world does have a, a natural way of being. And at the end of the day, you know, it's not always reflective of, of our behavior. And so that the natural world is going to act as the natural world is going to act. Um, and yet, to some degree, we know this is a function of our behavior. And so, and I'll, I'll address that in a second. I, I was astounded at two weeks after, you know, um, we read about the numbers of victims in Italy, and then to see the pictures from Venice of the canals, the water in the canals clearing up, and, the, and dolphins were swimming in places where dolphins had never been, and even here in Florida, you go outside and the air is a little clearer and it's a little bit fresher and it's quieter and bird life seems to be a little more active than usual. And that seems to be happening all over the place. So it's as if the natural world in some way is responding. I heard a um, 
So, okay, so that's one thing. I'm going to get back to that in a second. Yeah. Uh, religiously, I think that um, measuring these mo- this time by, by the response of a community, by people's capacity to reach out to other people. We have here about 80 people who are phoning about 1,500 households. So people who are alone or people who aren't alone but with others know that there's a community that cares for them. Um, we know that the, the significance of building community as a function of that which is important in Jewish life and how we kind of live out holiness and live out, you know, what our obligations are, that we are, we're people and, uh, and our people are in communities and the communities really reflect that which is holy, that which is godly, that which is good. And then I, I heard a lecture last week by a, a non-Jewish theologian, he's actually a, a, a pantheist, and he's a, an MSW who works with um, uh, palliative care. And he said something that was really profound, I thought. And although it may not be you know, scientifically proven yet, but he talked about how the natural world is divided into that which is the domesticated and that which we conquer as human beings and that which is wild and which is meant to be wild and where we have to sit in reverence in the face of that, that natural world and the wildness of the natural world. And he spoke about it in relation to the wet markets in Wuhan and said, there you had an example of that which had no business being in cages, that which could not be tamed with that which was tamed. And what we see then is that the wild has come and has asserted itself over that, that which is tame and that which is meant for us to control. And I thought about it in terms of this week's Parsha, in terms of Amor. And we know that there are numerous times in the Torah where the festivals and the holidays are listed. Sure, sure. This week, with the exception of Sukkot, they're all listed in relation to the cycles of the seasons and the harvest. It's not about our history. It's not about the events of the past or as much about ritual, but it's about, it's about the seasons. And so I do think that, that uh, the natural world, and that many of us, most probably almost everybody watching here, knows that um, we have such a, a deep concern for what's happening to nature and what's happening ecologically and to the balance of things. And I think this is showing us that uh, when this is over and God willing, this will be over, there are going to be other great challenges that we're gonna face socially, politically, economically, but also in terms of, in terms of nature. So yeah. those are the, some of the thoughts I've had about this. So okay. obviously there's not that much time to, to, yeah, no, to thank you. You know, I, you know, I'm just reminded listening to you about, about the things we can control, the things we can't control. Um, you know, we can control our responses. You know, I, I think a lot of what's, I, I had, I, I wrote my doctoral thesis on someone named Louis Jacobs, who wrote a book on just about everything, right? Jewish Gentile relations, diaspora Israel relations, um, you know, uh, every you know does god command does not command and he, he he never wrote a book on um on the holocaust and um i remember and he uh, the period of his time was at the very moment that everyone was writing responses to the holocaust and i said why did and and i interviewed him as i was writing my doctoral thesis about him and i i don't totally buy his answer but i just want to share his answer because I said, why didn't you ever write um, a book on post-Holocaust theology? And his answer is because was that the problem of evil or the problem of pain and suffering was amplified by a magnitude of six million in the Holocaust um, or in any natural disaster, right? Where's God in the hurricane? One's inflicted one human on another one's a natural disaster but the fundamental question is no different than the child born with a degenerative disease or the person who dies tragically in a car accident or the natural disaster right there are certain things uh, i mean we are feeling a series of 
where is God in COVID-19 questions, right? But this isn't the first, it, it, it's, it's particularly acute. It's of a magnitude that we haven't seen. But on a one-to-one -one basis with a family who's suffering, um, it's no different than, um, you know, than any other moment of inexplicable pain and sorrow. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's, uh, but, but I think the idea that, um, you know, as you're describing your own community um, and the community response of everyone calling everyone saying that we're physically distanced, but that doesn't mean we have to be socially distanced, that though we lack answers, um, we, we, we're not immobilized. Um, that's a moment that our humanity um, can, can come through. I see a question from- Before you uh, get to the question, I'd like to yeah. say one other thing about that. And then uh, the, there's been a couple questions about synagogue functioning and high holidays. And I'd like to get to that question after we do Joan Winograd's question. And Joan's one of our shared congregants. But this morning I was on a conference call with the director of public health in uh, Palm Beach County. And she began her, her uh, conversation saying the following. She said, the most important thing that, in, oh, and the conference call was with, cler with clergy, both Christian, Muslim, and Jewish clergy here. And she began her statement in the following way. She said, the most important thing that you men and women can do is pray. And it really made me very upset because I think the most important thing that we can do is to see to the health of our community to help people, um, to encourage people to take care of themselves. There's no question that there's a need for prayer, meditation, whatever kind of spiritual response. But one of the things as religious leaders that we have to do, and we are post-enlightenment religious leaders, is support the science. You know, to make a very strong statement in, in the face of medical evidence, because that stuff has been is questioned by politicians today. And we as religious leaders would do a great disservice to the healing of people if we don't support, you know, the facts, the science, the, the medical evidence that's there. So look at um, Joan's question. You want to take it? Yeah, look, I, I think um, I think showing up matters. I'm not in this moment, not physically. Um, I am struck by even in this moment that we can't be physically present for people the knowledge that someone is thinking of you there for you that you've written a note email text whatever mode of communication um, i think uh, those um, signals of that though people are isolated, they are not alone. It's not everything, but it's something. Mm -hmm. It's something. And I think that being present on a Zoom Shiva, I think, you know, the quiet gesture of a card, uh, some, some food being delivered, I, I don't know, whatever it might be. I think, Joan, I'm not, um, I, I think these things matter. And I think um, every indicator I've gotten, um, you know, of, of, you know, saying, would you like to set up a, a phone conversation? Um, you know, you have to respect people's boundaries. Some people just need to be alone and cry and everyone's measured in different proximity with the relationships. You don't want to overstep. But the simple gesture that saying you're there if they need you, um, I think is, is something, err on the side of doing more, not less. Um, and respect people if they don't respond, right? No one's under any, just because you sent them an email, don't expect that your email is going to be returned. It's there. Um, people are doing the best they can. You know, I find, yeah, David. No, I was going to say, my own experience in the last few weeks, and as I mentioned, and as Elliot's mentioned, we've been working really hard. Uh, this past Monday night, Elliot and I joined with uh, three other, four other co colleagues from Boston, Chicago, and LA. 
and we talked about some of the questions, like the question from Frank and Sheldon that are coming up. What are we doing as uh, synagogues? How are we going to prepare for what's coming up for the holidays? But it was so comforting for us to be able to talk to, to each other, to share kind of the pain that we're witnessing, but also this, the, the great unknown that we're all feeling, the uncertainty. But it was just in the capacity to, to meet, you know, as friends and as colleagues and, and be able to do that. So, John, that, I think that's, I agree 100% with Ellie. You just have to reach out however you can reach out without seeing somebody in person. And it does make a difference. Yeah. You know, I do worry, David, um, thinking of addressing this on Shabbos, but, you know, uh, there's such economic, medical, you know, crises of our moment. Um, there, there are also a million, um, and, you know, it's hard to talk about it because you know, you know, when, when, when a high school, I have one daughter who's a senior in high school, who's second semester, who's, you know, who doesn't know what's going on and won't be having an in-person graduation. I have another, my kids are a bit younger than yours, David, but, um, you know, camp is canceled. You know, things are dropping. There are a million sort of small dreams being deferred and delayed. And it's hard because, you kind of, you know, the human response is to say, well, at least you're alive, right? At least you're, you know, may your problems all be like this. But I promise you, speaking to a 16-year-old, um, that, that, <laughs> that doesn't work. Um, and I think, um, so whatever you want to call it, the more quotidian or mundane disappointments that everyone is feeling right now, um, certainly children and grandchildren right now, um, I, I don't, I don't have a, a clear, you know, but I'll just share something I shared with one of my classes the other day that um, when, you know, one of my kids was sort of at a breaking point of, you know, that camp, uh, the prospect of camp being canceled, I sort of said, well, what do you want to hear? What, what, what exactly do you want? And they said, well, a good start. <laughs> I, I don't remember the exact language. I wish I had a recording of it, but it was like a, a good first step would be just for an adult to say how much this moment sucks. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know that 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 on a certain level, and I, I think this is part of Joan's question, but it, it's part of all of our questions, which is I think you just have to affirm that this is not the way the world should be, and there are disappointments, small and large, for our children, our grandchildren, for we ourselves, um, that there is an overarching sense of loss right now. Um, yeah, and I always think that um, it's really important for us and for people, uh, people in helping professions to allow people to give voice to the heartbreak. You know, this is a really sad time. People, the, the most common question that's asked is, how are you doing? And I, my response often is, that's a really complex question. So I see my life in these concentric circles. Thank God I'm well, my wife is well, our kids are well, our grandkids are well. But then you look out and you see how much pain there is in the world, how frightened even those of us who are well are and certainly were before we knew how this would begin to play out. And then you see the suffering that's gonna take place on all different levels. And so, and so with your kids, you know, being able to give voice to that kind of disappointment. I don't. So my kids are older and I have some grandchildren. My four-year-old grandson loves going to preschool and he's been without any social interaction for you know, almost eight weeks now. And it's, it, I know that it's hard for him. It's really hard. My two and a half year old lives in a tiny apartment in, in Brooklyn and she's not receiving any socialization except from her parents. And sometimes I think that she's, you know, she, she's having a really hard time in that little space. Mm -hmm. and, uh, these are things that we won't, you know, this is a, a moment in all of our lives, in your life, my life, and everybody who's watching that we've never experienced anything quite like this. And it's going to be a defining moment in terms of what we make of this as we move from it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, David. Um, I know that people want specific answers about the fall, mm -hmm. but before we dive into those, 
Um, you, you just celebrated uh, you, uh, your, how many years uh, in the community? It was, there was a big celebration of February. Um, I, I've been here for 26, almost 26 years 22. now this month, but next month. So, so you have um, a couple more years under, under your belt than I do. Um, but in, in many respects, our, our communities are analogous one to the other. Um, we share membership. We're sort of big steeple communities. Um, what do you think, what, what do you think the long-term effects, whether it's for us, for synagogue life in general, um, what, where, what, what do you see happening? Um, please God, when we're, when we're out of this. Yeah. When we were on in that conversation with our colleagues, uh, Rabbi Eddie Feinstein from uh, Valley Beth Shalom in Los Angeles said something really interesting and I've been thinking a lot about it and I've thought about it previously and I think it's particularly uh, uh, applicable for the uh, conservative synagogues and that he said you know a year ago two years ago people were saying the day of the big institution inst big institutionalized uh, synagogues is done it's over but what we're seeing here is that we have the capacity to react to respond uh, to show some type of resilience, to be present for people, different age groups, different times that the small synagogues don't have. So I think what it might do, and I don't, I don't know how this is going to take shape, is to create within our movement these uh, synagogue centers where there can be smaller groups, smaller minyanim and synagogues uh, that operate. But I'm convinced that the technology is not going to go away. That's no, that's no chachma. We're going to have this technology, and what we see is we're able to reach people in ways that we weren't able to reach people uh, previously, and so that we're going to be able to use the resources of a big congregation to reach more people than we did previously. So that's one thought, and um, um, there are other things also. I don't know. Yeah, what do you think? I, I, I think. Well, I mean, there's sort of two parts to it that you touched on, David. Um, number one is I think there will be things that um, will continue well beyond this moment. Uh, you know, I, I, I can imagine uh, hybrid Zoom sh uh, Shiva announcements. The family will be observing Monday, Tuesday in their home. Wednesday will be online for all the out for anyone else. Like I can imagine a new normal emerging. I can imagine our adult ed catalog saying Melton is on Thursday morning at the synagogue and there's another Melton Zoom class, you know, that, that there'll be sort of one page that's virtual learning and one page that is um, not, I can imagine there being sort of um, membership dues um, for non-resident members who want to virtually stream and you get a password um, to click on to a website or or whatever. I mean, the the possibilities are 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 endless here of um, what it would mean to have um, a virtual a community with its campus and its virtual campus. Um, and so I think that's coming down the line, um, and I think it'll be dare I say, a very exciting time as we reimagine our rabbinates into, and our communities into the years ahead. I think that um, the other question I'm, I'm much more somber about, um, and it, it, it's also a funny thing to say, I think you and I lead communities that have large staffs, um, generational support, um, uh, but you and I both know that um, the story of B'nai Torah and Park Avenue Synagogue is not a story that's shared in every small community in Long Island, in New Jersey, I'm sure in neighborhoods in Florida, um, that there are going to be uh, communities that are in real pain, in real economic crisis. Um, they're already not well resourced. Um, I think that story, and, and I think that's going to beg the question of, um, uh, what role, um, you know, if, if you want to divide it up into large synagogues, sort of startup sort of initiatives, and then the middle territory of mid-sized synagogues, 
I think there might be opportunities for all of us to play in the sandbox differently um, that a class being live streamed by one community. I'll give you a small example. Um, we, we have a great thing going with um, Jewish Lives, a terrific book series um, on, you know, it could be Moses Mendelssohn, Hank Greenberg. Um, and so we have a relationship with the publication that we have a book club, right? And then whoever wrote the book on Hank Greenberg gives a lecture after we've done it, right? It's terrific. It's really nice. It's sort of a plug and play program. But there's no reason why it can't be open to a dozen synagogues. And whoever the author is, is talking about the life of Rashi to everybody, right? So there are things like that, that I think we just need to be creative about. You know what I, what I found the, uh, personally, the first week that we did Zoom services on Shabbat, um, I was able, I found myself being able to present myself differently than I do on the Bima. So I'm not wearing a suit and a big talus and a, you know, in a tie and um, distant up on the bima of this big, you know, this big uh, uh, sanctuary. Do you wear a tie on a typical Shabbat in the Torah? <laughs> what do people in Florida do? Uh, I just imagine you in like sandals and uh, uh, a okay. sort of Jimmy Buffett shirt uh, every Shabbos. Not Boca. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, and so, but there's, but... <laughs> The bima is distancing in some way, but when you're doing this, you know, like you're close to people and you can talk. And I felt it. I felt uh, a a level of closeness, if not intimacy, that I don't necessarily feel on the bima. And that was really a surprise to me. I didn't expect to be able to to find that. So that you know, that was a that was a good thing. But there's uh, the other issue here as we're aware, and I think that a lot of the people who are listening would probably be aware also, is that um, membership for many of our members is about finding a place to put yourself, a seat to sit in on the high holidays. And so I think that uh, we're gonna have to call upon our committed members to help us to retain membership because we are, membership is a very important uh, dimension of the, our ability to fund ourselves if we lose a lot of members, then all of this is kind of for naught. On the other hand, I think it's, it's become pretty obvious to our members just how important their membership was to create the institution that's been able to be so, you know, so uh, light-footed and resilient at this time and to provide what congregants need. And it's not just programming. It is that the connection with rabbis and teachers and our social workers and our, you know, leadership <clears throat> Our te and so I think that that's going to be a concern that we're going to have to share with others as yeah. we move forward and figure that out. Yeah, look, the I see that there are a lot of questions about um, the high holidays, and I need to be a little circumspect because the honest answer is I, I simply um, don't know right now. I can say we're actively having those conversations, uh, as and um, but um, and there are a series of unknowns. And as anyone who reads a paper, the playing field is changing. Where we are today is definitionally going to be different than where we are August 1 or otherwise. So um, there are unknowns that are changing unknowns. The, um, but, and then the synagogues aren't holding all the cards. Um, there's uh, New York City is just like any community, but probably we will be even more so asking the questions and following the cues of the governor and the mayor about opening up public institutions. I think there's going to be a series of questions about the holidays that are sort of predicated on the question of how to get as many tushes into as few a seats as possible what, how, how does that math work in a yeah. time of physical distancing? And then there's the question of um, the, the psychological dimension, meaning even if tomorrow, um, please God, a vaccine is 
discovered and there, there's some medical something something that happens um you know our members our our people even if the governor announces everyone can go back to work is everyone going to just go back to shul um and so that has nothing to do with me that has to do with people's comfort level um about public assembly so I think all of these are in the mix right now. Um, and that's kind of, to those who have written questions about high holidays, um, that's as honest an answer as I can give. I would, uh, I would ask people that are asking questions about the high holidays and have thoughts about the high holidays to write us letters, to let us know what you think, you know, what your ideas are. And we're looking for creative things. One thing that's pretty clear is that there are going to have to be a number of different options developed. There won't simply be one response, not with our synagogues, to how we do the high holidays. We're gonna to have to have different, different things presented, whether it's stuff that we pre-program -pro, pre and pre-package or Zoom services or limiting the number of people in our sanctuary, shortening our services, all of that sort of thing. Um, again, you know, Eddie Feinstein said last week, you know, he said something, guys, you know, the, the synagogue life as we knew it will no longer be the same. No matter how this turns out, that we realize there are going to be huge changes. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, well, interestingly, Elliot, there, you know, Benator has this whole snowbird population. And as you know, the Canadian conservative movement tends to be a little more traditional and more halachic than uh, most of the American communities, not all, but most. So there's some of the synagogues that people from who are snowbird members at B'nai Torah have gone back to. They don't do Zoom on Shabbat. They're not live streaming on Shabbat. And so all those people who were part of our community when they lived here and then went back home to their home communities, they're still with us. And, you know, for us, that's something nice about that. But yeah. I don't know what will be, how those communities ultimately will figure out a way to get their footing back. Yeah, um, that's true, because um, there's a financial element, obviously, there's a spiritual element of, of the high holidays. And if your communities like mine, you know, there are people who are in the building, you know, I, I look at synagogue membership in concentric circles, there are those who are in the synagogue every single day of the year, probably more log more hours than I do in the building. There are those people who are sort of the middle circle of taking adult ed classes, coming to Shabbos services, otherwise. And then, it, you know, synagogue membership also has those people who whose only point of contact are the high holidays. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, and, and our synagogues operate, I imagine yours does, mine certainly does, that there's a place for all those Jews in our community. Right. Um, and they're all critically important um, and affirmed. Uh, but what happens if if that if that Kol Nidre moment um, is you know that's part of their spiritual uh, uh, lives? So, um, but you know, uh, did you see the what was it called the Saturday Night Seder? Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah. So they did a great job with that, and they were able to create some very spiritual moments in that, and that was really nice. But I'd like to like tie that into Frank Kreutzer's question about will um, synagogues, will there be a need for, for synagogues with walls in the future, something like that Frank asked. And I would say that in spite of all the things that we can create and that we have created and that we'll continue to create, there's nothing that replaces the relationship between people, person to person. So we'll always have walls, I think. I mean, maybe that's short-sighted. But for now, for this generation, there's always going to be a need for us to come together in some way to be able to see each other, each other and touch each other when the time is right. I don't, we're not going to give that up. And after the renovation you guys just went through, you would, you dare not say. Right, you can see it in the background. <laughs> you see the, uh, the, the nice, uh, the building right here. Yeah, yeah. It's all been redone. Yeah. Um, look, the, uh, 
I, a few years ago, I gave a sermon on why it was entitled Why Synagogue that I turned into an article um, that in this time of disintermediation, right, there's no longer a blockbuster video. We download our content, um, you know, Borders Bookstore is but a memory. Um, the mall business is a tough business. Um, you know, the synagogues... Um, and th this might be behind Mr. Kreutzer's question, synagogues, you know, do they have a, a future? All the more so right now. I think, um, I, I'm, look, I'm biased, but I believe that synagogues are totally countercultural, which is why I believe they have a future. Meaning in this moment where the vast majority of our information we get from our phones, right? That I'm, you can't see it, but I'm holding one right now, um, right? That we have more data coming in without interaction with others. Um, it makes the case statement for community life that much more compelling. All the more so in a synagogue, unlike say a museum or an academic, right? It's a very idea that the community that you are taking an adult ed class with, that you are sitting in shul with, that you are going to a shiva or an early childhood program, and also going on the B'nai Mitzvah trip to Israel, right? This virtuous cycle of event after event after event, going through life with those community members, um, there's nothing like it out there, right? Show me another institution that that does that, um, which is, um, I'm, I'm not, I don't have blinders on to the challenges, but I think it has a differentiated place in the landscape of um, of American life than, than any other institution. I agree. I agree. I think that's one of the reasons that we get, went into this work so listen, you wanna, we'll close this up now. I, I really want to thank you for your time. I'm really happy that so many people chose to spend this hour with us. And um, we'll stay in touch and we'll exchange ideas. And I would say to everybody out there, if you have thoughts about uh, how synagogues can be even more nimble and how we respond to this stuff as religious, religious communities, we're open to hear it all. Amen. Amen. And, and David, uh, you have, an, for all of the B'nai Torah people who have a foot in the New York community, um, uh, Rabbi Steinhardt, you have an open invitation to, uh, once we're all back to, uh, to normal, please God, hop on a plane and you can address your Florida, your Florida members in what you refer to as B'nai Torah North. <laughs> Park so listen, choose choose a uh, weekend next February to come down, and you can take a take a little break from the cold and join us here. So. Amen. I would love that. I would love that. Okay, so God um, bless. Uh, Shabbat right. shalom to you. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. shalom. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Bye bye. Be safe. Thank you all. Have a good day.